Good morning, everybody. Glad to have everybody here this morning. It's been uh, a wonderfully sweaty week. I think it's the best way I can say that. Uh, but it's been a great week. Sunshine. Uh, it's just been great. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for keeping us safe this week, bringing us together once again. We thank you for keeping Dave and, and Chris healthy, getting him over the, the virus, uh, and just keeping all of us, the rest of us, from getting it. Lord, it's just a testament to who you are and, and how much you love us, Lord. We just, we just ask that you take our worship today and accept it, Lord, and continue to be our Father, and we will be your children. Just offer ourselves to you in prayer. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. From Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, we read, But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him. Through the blood of Christ. used to always say to me, Do you think I'm made of money? Turn off the lights. Do you think money grows on trees? Turn the heat down. If you're cold, put on a sweater. You call that music? Turn that down. Turn it off. We're not lost. No, we're not there yet. Don't make me stop this car. I will turn this car around right now. What part of no don't you understand? I'm not just talking to hear my own voice. I'll tell you why. Because I said so, that's why. Call it a haircut? What keeps those jeans from falling off? Tuck in your shirt. Wipe your feet. Get your elbows off the table. The early bird gets the worm. You want something to do? I'll give you something to do. When I grew up, I had a job on a farm at 13. Oh, as long as you live under my roof. Stop crying, or I'll give you something to cry about. I brought you into this world. I can take you out of it. How's the job search going? Don't touch my car. My first car only had three wheels. What is this, a pigsty? Go make your bet. I walked 10 miles to school. Through 10 feet of snow. Appeals both ways. In my day, when I was your age, I had three jobs. This is going to hurt me a lot more than it's going to hurt you. Do you need anything? Are you sure you don't need anything? You can be whatever it is you want to be. As long as you tried your hardest, that's what really matters. You'll get it next time. You did your best. That's my boy. That's my girl. I'm proud of you. Real proud of you, son. I'm so proud of you. You'll always be my little girl. Thanks, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Thank you so much. I love you, Daddy. I love you, Dad. Daddy, I love you. I love you, Dad. Isn't it great to know, though, that we have dads? And I, I, I don't know, when I went through that and I watched it the first time, I was like, yes, yes. Well, that was mom. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and I think one of my dad's favorite stories that he loved to tell us we were kids growing up was like, we were so poor The mom used to tie a string around the one piece of bacon that we had to eat all winter long. And you got to lick it. But if you tried to swallow it, she jerked back on that string and pulled it right out of your face. Now it's really. Yes, really. Okay, we'll, we'll start with a thank you prayer for all of our fathers. Um, Chris has a thank you prayer for successful melanoma, melanoma surgery. Nancy says thank you for all the birthday cards and wishes. Um, Prayers for a solution at Menards for the Fricks, for rain, for crops and gardens. Um, protection from COVID, pneumonia, colds, and all germs. I'm going to put a big star by that one. Uh, protection for America from shootings and killings. Under health, 
Todd's partner's father has possible Parkinson's. Nancy's friend was just um, diagnosed with Parkinson's and is not dealing well with the diagnosis. Tabitha's dad is waiting on a PET scan for the liquid that they have to put in him. George and Blanche are getting out and about. Katie? Well, praise the Lord that, that uh, George and Blanche are finally able to get out and get around. I know that's been eating at Blanche more than it's been eating at George, but it's good to know that they're getting out. I know getting that power off was a big thing for Blanche, so praise the Lord for that as well. Heavenly Father, we just lift these prayers up to you, Lord. We know that no prayer goes unanswered. Lord, so we lift them up to you. Prayers for healing, you know, prayers for peace, prayers for protection, Lord. It just uh, just everything about our lives, Lord. We we offer up a prayer to you, Lord, not just our own, our friends, our families, Lord, that we know you are here, present with us, no more, less than an arm's length away, ready to pick us up when we need to, ready to keep, walk with us, to carry us if that needs to. Lord, and we thank you and praise you for that as well, Lord. We also lift up our nation and our, our world, Lord, that's in such turmoil, Lord. And, and it's in that turmoil because we have lost our focus and we don't look to you. We don't place our focus on, on you and your precepts anymore, Lord. And so we just pray that that the people will do that and that our leaders will do that because we know where the leader goes, the people will follow. Lord, and, and we just pray for our, our leaders, our governor and our president and even our mayors of our communities, Lord, and, and all those in between, that they will seek out your guidance for their leadership, Lord, that they will publicly announce that they are seeking your guidance and using your word as a tool for their decision making. Lord, because we know that the only way for us to, to make this world a better place is to follow Jesus, to follow in his footsteps and follow in that obedience to your word, Lord. So we just, we just lift this all up to you, Lord, and lift it up in the name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Again, welcome to those of you who are here joining us this morning, and those of you online. It's good to have everybody with us this morning. Um, and obviously, our, our technology bug is back, uh, but we'll get through this. Uh, we're going to start a new series today, Following Jesus. Um, I thought this would be a good a good idea to, to help ourselves. In the last series we talked about uh, evangelism and discipleship. So why not help ourselves grow a little bit closer to Jesus if we're going to help others grow closer to Jesus as well. So this morning's uh, message is titled The Heart of Heaven. Uh, and it's about Jesus and you know, it's following. Uh, you know, there's four themes that run through Scripture, um, you know, and all concerning Jesus and the Word of God. Uh, you know, one of them is, is making room for Jesus, bringing Jesus into our lives and accepting Him and, and having a part of us that is devoted to Him. The other being, another being community and how as a church, we are we are a family, but we're not just a family within these four walls. We're a family that is universal and outstretched across the whole world. Um, and the next week's message, which will be God's word is living and active. It's not just a bunch of words on a page. It's it's so much more than what we read. It's it's an emotional aspect of who we are and what goes on in our lives. And then today's message. 
of distance changes perspective. Have you ever noticed that when you're looking at something, it changes? You know, it changes depending on how close you are to it or how far you are away from it. Um, you know, it's our, our first impressions differ depending on how we first see something. And, you know, it's like it's that, that old phrase, you know, seeing the trees in the forest or seeing the forest through the trees, which one are you looking at? And, you know, it's our relationship with, with Jesus is kind of the same way. The church has a, a unique way of looking at Jesus. We have our, you know, we have our beliefs and our faith in who he is. But sometimes we, we can either be too close to Jesus. And so we're looking at scripture, we're looking at the word of God, and, and you know, it's right here, and all we're seeing are one or two verses of it. And, and you know, there are several churches and organizations that sometimes they get up on their soapbox and that's all it's all about are those two verses and it's like the rest of the Bible doesn't exist. Or you can have the other end of it where we're standing far enough away from it that we see the whole thing but we don't know enough of the detail about what scripture is telling us where we can't put those one or two verses that we see when we're up close with the rest of the 66 books of the Bible and get the entire story and be able to tell it. And, and God doesn't want a long distance relationship with us. He wants to be close to us. And I think one of the best stories uh, to show that, and I know we, we did this just a few months ago, we talked about Zacchaeus, and, and we're really focused on him. But we're going to use him again. We're going to take a look again in, in Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Verses 1 through 10. This morning I'm going to read from the message version. Uh, it's a, a common English version uh, that sometimes just speaks a little bit more bluntly uh, than our other versions do. And so it says this. Then Jesus entered and walked through, Je walked through Jericho. There was a man there, his name, Zacchaeus, the head tax collector, and was quite rich. He wanted desperately to see Jesus, but the crowd was in his way. He was a short man and couldn't see over them. So he ran on ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus when he came by. And when Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus. Hurry down here. Today is my day to be a guest in your house. Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing his good luck, delighted to take Jesus home with him. Everyone who saw the incident, let's back up a little bit. Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing his good luck, delighted to take Jesus home with him. Everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grumped. What business does he have getting cozy with this crook? I don't know. I see the, the old footage of President Nixon. <coughs> I am not a crook. When I read that from the message version, I just, but anyway. Zacchaeus stood there a little stunned, stammered apologetically. Master, I give half my away half my income to the poor, and if I'm caught cheating, I pay four times the damages. Jesus said, today is salvation day in this home. Here he is, Zacchaeus, son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to find and restore the lost. You know, most of the time when we look at Zacchaeus, we have a tendency to focus on his height and his career, and you know, and that, those are all important parts of who Zacchaeus is. But you know, and, and <coughs> excuse me. But sometimes we miss something important, or the reasons 
behind him wanting to see Jesus. If you noticed in that scripture, it says that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. Not Zacchaeus wanted to meet Jesus, or Zacchaeus wanted to touch Jesus. He simply wanted to see him. Why would Luke write that he wanted, just wanted to see him? Well, you know, we look at Zacchaeus, and you know, he had to have been filled with all kinds of emotions on that day, as I think most of us would be. If, you know, if we found out that Jesus was going to be walking down Main Street here in Lawrenceburg, you know, we would all get a flutter, and you know, and you know, today we'd probably be asking ourselves, well, "Why am I still here? Why am? Why didn't I walk in the in the rapture?" But, you know, back in Jesus' day, we would get excited about it. We'd have an emotional response to it. But Zacchaeus was a little different. You know, Zacchaeus was a Jew, uh, as was Jesus and his neighbors. But so he knew everything about the Messiah. Growing up, he went to temple. He learned from his rabbis. So he knew who the Messiah was supposed to be. And now, over these last few years, he's been hearing stories about this Jesus of Nazareth and the miracles that he's done and the things that, that he's taught and the way he's taught. He's like, is this really the Messiah? Is this who I think he is? Is this the Son of God? And so he's, you know, he's sitting there and he's like, Excited, questioning, and but as we discovered in our previous uh, series, love has a name. Zacchaeus was also ostracized by his community, hated. Uh, in today's version that we read, they called him a crook, and so you know he had a relationship with the enemy. He worked for Rome. And been picked on his whole life, so he probably thought he wasn't worthy of being met by Jesus. Actually, you know, so he just he climbed the tree to see who Jesus was. And you know, there are so many people out there that feel that same way. I know I did for a long time. I know many people that still do. I mean, how many times have we heard I need to get my life straightened out before I can I can have a relationship with Jesus? Or before I can come before God? Or, you know, God doesn't want somebody like me. I am way lost, way too bad to even think about coming before God. One of my personal favorites. Your church would probably fall down if I walked through the doors. Well, you know, last week we were surprised and the church did not fall down when somebody showed up. Uh, but you know, why do people feel that way? What is it that causes them? Honestly, I think they're in that group of people that's so far back from Scripture that they can't see it clearly. And when you're, when you're, you know, 30 miles away from a forest, all you see is this blur of trees, greens and browns and, and things off in the distance. You have to get kind of close to it before you finally start to realize, hey, wait a minute, those are trees. And you know, they're, they're so far away that they, they can't see the truth of what is in the Word of God. And the second thing is, is they've been affected by those people who, the, those believers who are too close to the scriptures. And they, they keep quoting those verses I add them about, you know, well, alcohol is a bad thing. And, you know, you're, you're, you're this or you're that based on one or two scriptures. And so they don't. They're getting conflicting views of what Scripture is about. 
And Zacchaeus is a pretty good example of that. You know, Israel was called to show God's love to the world. And, you know, although Israel, you know, Zacchaeus wasn't the nicest guy in the world, he cheated his friends and family. But they weren't showing very much love to him either. Even growing up, I'm sure that he was taunted by his peers. And so he, he just felt that I'm not good enough to be close to Jesus. But then Jesus does what he so often does in turning the, uh, the understanding of God's word on its head. And he invites himself to lunch with Zacchaeus. And he forces the people to step back and look at him and go, what in the world's going on here? Why is he dining with him? That doesn't make any sense. If he's God, like he says he is, why is he associating with a sinner? Why is he hugging this man? Why is he shaking his hand? And at the same time, he pulls Zacchaeus in from that distant view of who he is to show him the love and the grace and the mercy of God. Both giving a clearer understanding, hopefully giving a clearer understanding. We know Zacchaeus did, and we hope some of the other people did. But the point here is that God does not want a long-distance relationship. He doesn't want to be seen as somebody off in the distance just watching. He wants to be a part of your life. You know, unlike some of the conversations we have, or, you know, today, oh, this, you talk to kids today, and, you know, they're on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. Oh, I've got 5,000 friends or followers. They like to call them friends, but they're followers. Are they really friends? Do they really know the intimate secrets of your life? Not really. The good news is God does not want to be that kind of a relationship. He wants to be in an intimate relationship with you. He is trying to be in that relationship. And the best example of that is exactly what Jesus did on the cross at Passover and Easter Sunday. Remember the events on Good Friday? Rested, tried, put on the cross between two criminals. We turn to, to Luke 20, verses 40 to 43. It says, But the other one made him shut up. So you have the two criminals, one on his left and one on his right. And the one on the right is joined with the, the crowd in ostracizing and chastising Jesus, you know, saying that, Look, well, you're God. Get us all off of here and let us live. And the other one turns to him and tells him, shut your mouth. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. <coughs> we, you and I, we deserve this. But not him. He did nothing to deserve this. And then he turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus turned and looked at him and said, don't worry, I will. Today, remember that word, today you will join me in paradise. Here we are, the worst possible moment in the lives of these three men. 
One, attacking Jesus, just like the crowd is. And the other one, defending Jesus. Admitting that he deserves what he's getting. I'm getting my just due. I screwed up. I stole, I killed, I caused problems. I deserve this. And then you have Jesus in between. Ever the comforter, providing the mercy of God. He ignores his own pain. And I, can, I can just imagine they are, there they are sitting there. I mean, Jesus on the cross, maybe with his head down a little bit, listening to what's going on. During parts of it, speaking out, but silently praying. And he just looks up and he looks at him and says, don't worry. Today. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow. Not in three days when I raise from the dead. Not in seven weeks, 50 days. On the day of Pentecost, when I meet with my disciples the last time. Or, I'm sorry, 40 days when I meet and I'm taken up into heaven. No. Today, upon your death, you are going to go into paradise. That's a whole other sermon in and of itself about our own salvation. And then, Matthew adds to this scene. In chapter 27, we read, But Jesus, again crying out loudly, breathed his last. At that moment, the temple curtain was ripped in two, top to bottom. There was an earthquake, and rocks were split in pieces. So, Jesus tells the, 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 the criminal next to him, the thief next to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. And then a few hours go by. Jesus says, it is finished. My soul I give to you. And dies. Immediately. God doesn't waste any time. You know, so often people are like, well, why is God waiting so long? Everything's got a perfect timing for him. This was his. Jesus dies. That curtain. The curtain that he's talking about is the one that, that hung in the temple between the holy places where the altar was and the common place where the priests would be. That curtain was six inches thick. A piece of six inch thick fabric split top to bottom. You'd be hard to cut through that with even today's modern knives and swords just out of strength of alone, but it was torn in half. Opening the door, God opened the door at that very moment that Jesus fulfilled his commitment <coughs> to make sure that there was nothing separating him from the rest of humanity. Nothing between us and him anymore. God wants to be close to you. Arm's length is too far away. Those of you who are in the military or new people in the military, you know, what do you guys do with parades? When you do parade march, dress right dress. One arm in front, one arm to the side. That's too far away for God. He wants to be right next to you. To be able to wrap his arms, to be able to you, for you to wrap your arms around him at a moment's notice. And that closeness comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We are united through Christ with God. We were once far off, but now because of Jesus, because of his death, his resurrection, the splitting of that curtain, the spilling of his blood, we are washed and able to come close 
to God. So why do people still keep their distance? Why do they settle for that? I just need to keep you out right there, God. Even though they know, they've been told that Jesus paid the price for their sins. They have nothing to worry about. I think our, our interpretation of Zacchaeus today kind of gives us two things about that. The first is the feeling of unworthiness. You know, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus didn't believe he was worthy. <coughs> he was worthy of being near Jesus, let alone in the same room with him. And as a result, didn't think he could have a relationship with him. Zacchaeus was in a position, he had the money that he could have bought time with Jesus. He could have made sure he was at the front of the line, in front of the crowd. But his brokenness prevented him from doing that. Guilt and shame. Two feelings that are overly influential in our lives that cause us to hide from God. Two things that Satan gladly uses to keep us separated from God. The same thing he did to Adam and Eve in the garden. See, Satan is a master deceiver and tempter. He will whisper in our ears how bad and unlovable we are after he tells us, no big deal. All you got to do is pray and ask God for forgiveness. Don't worry about it. It's that sin that separates us from God. But what we fail to remember is that even though we are sinful and there is that separation, it never stops God from loving us. God promised to always love us, to never leave us. So instead of running and hiding like Adam and Eve did in the garden, running away from God, we should be running to Him. Ready to embrace Him, ready to have Him hold on to us. You know, that thief, the second thief, could have just as easily sided with his friend hanging there on the cross, but he didn't. Instead of running away from who Jesus was, he came to Him, acknowledged who he is as a sinner. And even more than that, confesses who Jesus is as the Savior. Asking for forgiveness and to be remembered in the kingdom. He didn't run away, he ran too. He does not let his, vision, his brokenness push him away. In fact, it was his inspiration close to Jesus. Which brings us to that second thing that Zacchaeus uh, gives us. Our vision of Jesus. Because of his own brokenness, Zacchaeus thought he was below Jesus and not to be near him. This is actually a picture from Prodigal Son, another story written by Luke about restoration, which a son demands from his father what he deserves for an inheritance, runs off, wastes it, ends up living, excuse me, living in the slot home with the pigs. I can imagine when he decided to go back to his dad, what that was like for him walking as he approached. His dad's farm comes up over the crest of the hill, sees the hogs off in the distance, just 
oh man, I gotta face my dad, he's gonna be so mad, he's gonna throw me out, he's not gonna listen to me, I've gotta, I'm gonna have to beg for, for forgiveness and, and be treated like one of his slaves. See, he saw his dad as hard and unforgiving. And if you see God that way as well, you're going to have that separation. You're going to wonder why you can't get it. Or you're going to be afraid to be close to him. People have that vision or that idea of God and of Jesus as being that way because they don't get close enough to the Lord. We should see God as our creator and loving father, not as an all-powerful tyrant demanding things of us. We see him as the, the father of the prodigal son, where we look up as we're approaching, and instead of seeing an angry man standing there, waiting for us to get to him, he comes running out to greet us, to sweep us up off our feet, spin us around in a great big bear hug and call his servants to bring in the fatted calf because we're going to have a party. Jesus isn't mad at you. He isn't a tyrant. In our times of when we stumble, he wants to actually be closer to us, not further away. To spend time with you. In fact, to carry you, if that needs to be the case. See, Jesus and the Father, God, will always run to you, not away from you. It's unfortunate that a few years ago, a college, a liberal, uh, secular college, put a survey out to the student body and asked two questions. Do you believe there is a God? And do you believe that God has a plan for you? The majority of the students answered, yes, I believe there is a God. But the majority of those students also said, I don't believe he has a plan for me. They saw him as uninterested and hard and demanding, not creative and loving. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person. And they with me. You want know, to read this verse uh, as long as, uh, for as long as I can remember, back when I was a kid, growing up, when I heard this verse or I read this verse, I was always reminded of a Wings, a Paul McCartney and Wings song called Let Them In. It's a very simple song. Two verses and a chorus that has three lines in it that go, someone's knocking at the door. Somebody's ringing the bell. Someone's knocking at the door. Open the door and let them in. You know, and it's, we have to open that door. We have to invite Jesus and we have to bring him in and bring him close to us. It says here, when you do that, he'll sit down and eat with you. In our last series, we talked about how sharing a meal is one of the most intimate things we can do with each other because we learn so much from the conversation that we have. When we don't open that door, we don't get close to Jesus. Too many people have this image of him, that he's going to walk up, he's going to hand me that little orange chance card and say, you know, that get out of hell free card and turn around and walk away and never talk to me again. That couldn't be further from the truth. If we take a close look 
at verse 20 of Revelation 3, we see that Jesus is calling us. He's committing himself at the most intimate level. One that very few of us even want to do with each other or that we understand. Actively calling us. He's knocking on the door. Let him in. He's not going to just introduce himself. Hey, I'm Jesus. How are you doing? Have a great day. Here's your get out of hell free card. No. He's going to walk in. He's going to hug you. He's going to pick you up. He's going to spin you around like the prodigal son's father. And sit down with you at one of the most intimate times of our lives, the dinner table. You know, we don't eat with people we're not interested in or interested in having a relationship with. He doesn't want to just have a cup of joe and go on your way. No, he wants to have a seven-course, full-blown meal that lasts for a lifetime. Never doubt God's intentions. He wants to be with you. James 4, 8. Not one of my favorite verses, but probably should be, now that I think about it. it especially in relation to my, my, my personal favorite verse, which is Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine, so that everyone can see it. And glorify God our Father. Jesus wants to be close to us. We have to make that choice. God has already made up his mind. He tore the veil. He sent his son to die for us. It's right there in this verse. You don't need to get fixed up. You just need to come to him. Come to him when you want to cool off when it's hot outside. You know, that makes absolutely no sense for what I just said. Back up. Using that illusion, when it's hot outside like it was last week, you wanted to just jump into the pool. You didn't want to Dip. Dip. No, you wanted to jump in. You wanted to get cooled off. Didn't matter if you had the dirt on you from working out in the yard. You wanted to get in there and get cool. It's the same thing with Jesus. Jump in with him. Invite him in. Embrace him. Are you following him? Or are you doing it your own way? Maybe you were and you wandered off course and you're trying to get back. Well, to help you do that, to help you stay the course, to help you maintain, I'm going to email links to everybody each week for a devotion for the week to participate in. Not going to demand that you do it. You don't have to. But it's just a thought about getting to it. If you're watching on, on, online, send me your email. I'll send it to you. If you're not online, I'll print them out. You can do it with us as well. We can share stories when we come back together next week. Our relationship with Jesus is one to be close and intimate, not far off and distant. We need to be able to be close enough to see the verses and far enough away to see the book.
and the whole story. Heavenly Father, we just we 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 just we humbly come before you, giving ourselves to you, joining with you in this relationship, following your Son, our Savior, to be better children, to be better servants in your kingdom. We just give ourselves to you, Holy Lord, to be with you today in your kingdom. And we give ourselves to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you all have a blessed week this week. Enjoy the cooler temperatures. And keep an eye out for that link. If you want a printed copy of it, let me know and I will get that to you as quickly as I can. You guys have a blessed week.